centuries before Christ, Zechariah the prophet speaks of him. He speaks of him as the king coming on a foal, the colt of a donkey. And he also speaks of him, as that, that's Zechariah 9.9 9 and Zechariah 12.10, he speaks of him being the one upon whom they will look, that they have pierced. And now we come to the, what is called by Catholics Palm Sunday, the beginning of Passion Week, the week of Christ's suffering, the week in which he preaches to a great degree um, to the people of Jerusalem and in the temple, and which culminates in his arrest, trial, death, and glorious resurrection. Some have said, oh, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday was just a later manufacture of, of the Christians. It was a low-key affair. He may not have gone in there at all in any special way. So what I want to do is to read from Maria Valtorsa's vision of what actually happened 2,000 years ago. I shan't read the whole amount because, as usual, there's so much detail that it would mean the video would be extremely long. Just for the moment then before he goes into Jerusalem. Jesus stands up and makes a gesture, meaning that he's going to speak. Everybody becomes silent and Jesus' voice is heard clearly. Peace to you. Do not press together. We shall now go up to the temple. I've come to stay with you. Peace, peace. Do not hurt yourselves. Make way, my beloved friends. Let me come out and follow me, because we shall enter into the holy city together. Willy-nilly the people obey, and they open out a little, so that Jesus can come out and mount the little donkey. In fact, Jesus points to the little colt, which had never been ridden before as his mount. And then some rich pilgrims who elbow their way through the crowd lay their sumptuous mantles on its back. And one man kneels down with one knee on the ground and the other placed as a step for the Lord who sits on the back of the colt. And the journey begins with Peter walking on one side of the master and Isaac on the other, holding the reins of the unbroken animal, which proceeds calmly as if it were accustomed to that task without becoming restive or being frightened by the flowers that, thrown as they are towards Jesus, often strike the eyes or the soft muzzle of the little colt that is not even scared by the branches of olive trees and palm leaves shaken in front of and around it, or are thrown on the ground to form a carpet with the flowers. It is not even frightened by the shouts of Hosanna, son of David, that are becoming louder and louder as the crowd becomes larger and larger with the arrival of newcomers. It is not easy to pass through Bethphage along its narrow twisted streets and mothers are compelled to take their children in their arms and men have to protect their women from being pushed too violently and some fathers carry their little sons astride their shoulders so that they are above the crowd while the shrill voices of the children sound like the bleatings of lambs or the screeching of swallows, while with their little hands they throw the flowers and leaves of olive trees offered to them by their mothers, as well as kisses to mild Jesus. After leaving the narrow passage of the little suburb, the procession stretches out in an orderly manner and many volunteers go ahead leading the way and keeping it clear and others follow them, strewing the ground with branches. And when a man throws his mantle on the road as a carpet, hundreds of people imitate him. Thus, the central part of the road is a multicoloured strip of garments spread on the ground. And once Jesus passes by, they are picked up and carried ahead with many more, while flowers, branches and palm leaves are waved and thrown and louder cries are uttered around and in honour of the King of Israel, of the Son of David and his kingdom. The soldiers on duty at the gate come out to see what is happening, but it is not a sedition, and they move to one side, leaning on their lances, and looking amazed or ironical, they watch the strange procession of this king who is riding the colt of a donkey and is as handsome as a god as humble as the poorest of men, meek, blessing, surrounded by women and children, and by disarmed men shouting, peace.
peace, peace of this king who, before entering the town, stops for a moment near the sepulchres of the lepers at Hinnom and Siloam. And Maria Valtorta comments now, I think that I'm mentioning the correct names of these places where I've seen leopards being cured miraculously on other occasions. And she continues the narrative. And pressing on the only stirrup in which his foot is resting as he is sitting side saddle on the donkey, but not astride it. He stands up, stretches out his arms, shouting in the direction of those dreadful slopes. And she says in brackets, where frightened faces and bodies appear, looking towards Jesus. And they utter the plaintive cry of lepers, we are infected. To send away some imprudent people who, in order to see Jesus better, would climb even the contaminated and infected terraces. Jesus says, let those who have faith in me invoke my name and receive health from it. And setting out again, he blesses them. And he says to Judas, Judas Iscariot that is, you will buy food for the lepers and take it to them with Simon before it gets dark. When the procession enters under the vault of the Siloam gate and then like a torrent pours into the town through the Ophel suburb, where every terrace becomes a little airy square crowded with people singing hosannas, throwing flowers and pouring perfumes in the street, trying to throw them on the master, and the air is filled with the scent of flowers crushed under the feet of the crowds, and with essences that spread in the air before falling among the dust of the street. The cheers of the crowd seem to increase and become louder, as if each person shouted in a bugle horn, because the many archivolts of which Jerusalem is full amplify them with continuous echoes. I can hear them shout, and I think they mean what the evangelists say, Shalem, Shalem, Melchior, and she says it um, in brackets, or Malchis. I'm trying to give the sound of the words, but it's difficult because they have aspirations which we do not have. And she continues the narrative. A continuous howl, like the roar of a stormy sea, in which the loud noise of a billow pounding on beaches and cliffs has not yet dropped. When another breaker collects it and raises it with a fresh roar, without ever stopping, I am deafened by it. Perfumes, scents, shouts, waving of branches and garments, colours, cries. It is a bewildering scene. I see the people in the crowds getting mixed up continuously and known faces appear and disappear. All the disciples from all the places in Palestine, all the followers. I see Jairus for a moment and Jaya, the youth from Pella, I think, who was blind like his mother and was cured by Jesus. I see Joachim from Bosra and the peasants from the plain of Sharon with his brothers. I see lonely old Matthias from a place near the Jordan on the eastern bank where Jesus took shelter when the place was all flooded. I see Zacchaeus with his converted friends. I see old John from Nob with almost all the citizens. I see the husband of Sarah from Jutta. But who can cope with faces and names? It is a kaleidoscope of known and unknown faces, seen several times or only once. Now there is the face of the little shepherd brought from Enon, and near him is the disciple from Chorazim, who did not bury his father to follow Jesus. And close to him, for a moment, the father and mother of Benjamin from Capernaum with their son, who almost falls under the hooves of the little donkey when he throws himself forward to receive a caress from Jesus. And just to pause there, all those names I've mentioned, they're all characters in this vast work known as the Gospel as Revealed to Me or by its former title, The Poem of the Man God. Some of them you'll recognise from the Gospel itself, um, the, the, the um, man who wants to turn back from Jesus to go and bury his father, for example. Um, but, and Jairus, as another example. But most of those names you'll never have heard of. But they're not the only characters that appear 
in this masterwork of Maria Valtorta's, or of Jesus's, I should say, in my view. Um, there, are, there are hundreds of characters um, with extremely interesting um, involvement in the life, life of Jesus and the Blessed Virgin, the Apostles, as his public ministry proceeds. And of course, also, I should say, um, before the public ministry, of which we know little from the Gospels, there are plenty of characters there as well who will be new to all of us. But I'll continue with the narrative because she's described, Maria Valtos has described all those characters I, I mentioned, and it's a pleasant thing to describe them as being there at the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, which we now know as Palm Sunday. But she goes on about others she sees. And unfortunately, there are faces of Pharisees and scribes livid with rage because of this triumph and they overbearingly elbow their way through the circle of love that is pressing round Jesus, and they shout to him, Make these mad people keep quiet. Make them reason. Hosannas are to be sung to God only. Tell them to be quiet. I'll just pause again. Hosannas are to be sung to God only. These are the religious intellectuals. They were the theologians of their day. Hosanna is meant for God only. But the crowd are using it of Jesus. Some of the, that crowd is very well educated. Jairus, for example. If they're calling, if they're uttering Hosannas of Jesus, then they're seeing him as the deity. And since they're not polytheists, and there's only one deity for them. They're seeing him as God. But of course, some of them will be uneducated and will not know. But I'm just focusing on those who are educated and will know when they say Hosanna. But most interestingly, these theologians pointing this problem out to Jesus, that Hosannas have been directed towards him. Hosannas, which, as they say, are to be sung to God only. Does Jesus say, oh, right you are, the crowd are ignorant, they're mistaken, they're over-enthusiastic. I'll ask them to not say this. Here's what Jesus says. And it's what we have recorded in the Gospels, though they don't imply in the Gospels, we don't get this very important point that Hosannas are for God only. Here's what Jesus says, as we know from the Gospels. And Jesus replies to them kindly. Even if I told them to be silent and they obeyed me, the stones would extol the wonders of the word of God. And so we have there, Jesus is saying, I'm not going to stop them shouting hosannas. In fact, it's the right thing for them to do. And thus we have on this Palm Sunday, the very first Palm Sunday, the affirmation effectively out of the mouths of his enemies, the Pharisees, that he is God and it is proper for the crowd, that is us, those who believe in him, to call him God. So Hosanna to the son of David. 